thank you so much for joining us today for the HTQ Research Integrity Advisor Showcase. My name is Sonia Hancock. I'm the Manager of Research Integrity and Compliance at Metro South. I understand a few people are joining us. So I'll wait maybe just a few more seconds before I um, start with the introductions and the, um, the acknowledgement. All righty. Um, thank you to Helen in the background who's admitting all the um, attendees as they join up. So once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to, um, to get insight into how research integrity plays out in the real world. I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional landowners on the lands on which we meet for there are many and extend my respects to elders past, present and future and certainly to those um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today, paying my deepest respects and um, welcoming you all aboard. So before we get started, um, or as we get started, I'm actually going to talk very little, but I would like to um, invite everyone as the uh, conversation happens to think about questions and certainly use the chat function in which I'll keep an eye on. Questions will be asked after the presentations are done, um, because certainly the answers is probably more likely to generate discussion rather than one particular person answering the question. So if I can just ask you to hold off and think that the answers will be after the presentations. So without any um, further words from me, other than introducing our first speaker, Sarah Hubbard. So Sarah is an experienced advisor and educator in terms of human rights, ethics, research ethics and governance, consent and research conduct. Sarah holds over 10 years experience in health and research sectors and certainly I've had the joy of working with her and her brilliance and is currently engaged um, with the Torres and Cape Hospital and Health Service up in Queensland, managing research governance. Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Sonia. Hi, everybody, and thanks to Health Translation Queensland for inviting me to talk today. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Everybody can see that. All right. So I'm just going to dive straight in and just, I guess, set the scene for us today that we're talking about health and medical research. And in that space, um, researchers are staff. So they're either employed by an academic institution, uh, a research institute or university, or they're employed by a health institution, a hospital and or health service. And for many of our researchers, they are engaged by both an academic and a health institution through either adjunct roles or dual funded positions with their feet in both camps. But regardless of their employer, almost all health and medical researchers hold dual roles. So whether they are a researcher and a health professional, or if they're in the academic institution, they may also be an educator. But regardless of their role duality or their employer duality, they are staff first and foremost. And so they are bound by their employment contract and their award. The rules of their conduct as a staff member and thereby as a researcher are bound by the organisational framework and policies on the workplace. And research is undertaken in our workplaces. So whilst we strive to uphold the national standards for research conduct, this conduct is governed by our organisational frameworks and it cannot be viewed or managed in isolation from the workplace policies. Research activities and thereby research conduct often exist in bubbles in hospitals and health services where a clinician researcher bounces between their dual roles as a health service provider and an academic researcher. And whilst there are additional standards and guidelines placed on, at a national level on our research activities, they are not distinct or dissimilar. The national standards for research underpin the same workplace standards on employee conduct. On employee conduct. So let's have a look at what are the principles of good research conduct and what are our workplace values. So I'd like you all to just take a moment to go and find what your organisational values are. You should be able to look them up on your organisation's website or on your QEPS page. 
And then in this poll, I'd like you to identify how many of the principles from the Australian Code of Responsible Research Conduct match your workplace values. Helen, can you launch the poll, please? So, I'll give you all a minute or so to go and look it up. I'd be very impressed if any of you know this <laughs> off the top of your head. Helen, how many responses do we have so far? So far, we have 20, but they're rising quickly, 31 still rising. So we have almost 40%. We're now at 45, number of people 45. So we're at 40% of participants rising very quickly, though, still. Might try to hit 60 or 70% if we can before we share yep. the results. Okay, I think we'll call it there. Helen, can you share what we've got? Sure. So we can see here from your responses, there's quite a lot of overlap between our workplace values or our code of conduct, which most of our values are based upon, and the Australian Code for Research Integrity. Hitting up there nice and high, it's honesty, respect, recognition and diversity of First Nations peoples, accountability and responsibility are also big ones. So let's talk about what those organisational frameworks look like then. So the framework around an individual's conduct starts with workplace policy, such as the organisation's code of conduct, our values, as you've just seen, our employment conditions and any discipline specific practice regulations set by APRA or scope of practice, for example. And then there are the national research standards set by the code and the national statement, all of which are underpinned by legislation. Now I've included a list of potentially relevant legislation here, but this isn't a complete list. There are a number of others that might also apply, depending on the particular case um, behaviours or incident that might occur. So when a case of poor con research conduct is identified, it's the role of the research office first and foremost to collect facts and information and assess if the researcher's conduct would constitute a breach of the Australian code. The assessor or designated officer may also identify other elements in the organisational framework which could be implicated. It is then the role of the designated officer to refer the case with the information that they have to the appropriate delegate for further investigation and action. So the role of the research office is limited to collecting information and providing advice on the research matter only, remembering that the research is embedded in our workplace policies and our practice, um, either within the discipline that that health practitioner might identify um, and within the legislative framework in which the organisation is embedded. In serious cases, the research office um, or the HREC even may manage any ongoing research activities of the individual or the team to mitigate risk, such as temporarily suspending one or more studies, limiting the individual's research activities or placing additional monitoring until the matter is resolved. When multiple frame elements of the framework are impacted, it can be difficult for the designated officer to determine who the appropriate delegate is to oversee the investigation. 
And this can also vary between organisations. So the designated officer should discuss it with their delegate or exec sponsor in the first instance. And as suggested by the NHMRC guide for managing potential breaches, in these cases, a panel will be established with delegates for each element. Um, and I think the same philosophy applies is that we aren't experts in everything and our research office brings the subject matter expertise around our research standards and around the research study itself in which the incident or event occurred. Um, our human resource office is an expert in employee conduct and managing performance issues, managing behaviour of a specific individual, in the same sense that our legal team is an expert in our employee contracts, service agreements, and even legal agreements around the research that might be implicated in that. So depending on the span of what can be impacted by the particular case, you would want a subject matter expert and an appropriate delegate from each of those elements to be part of the formal investigation if one was to ensue. If the case relates only to research standards and is minor in nature, then in my experience, those cases can just be managed internally by the research office. But commonly what we see are referrals to other departments such as the patient safety team, human resources, legal, um, the Crime and Corruption Commission if required, and our Ethical Standards Unit in Queensland Health. In my experience, most cases of research of poor research misconduct are unintentional and not malicious. They're often accidental and minor in nature and usually the consequences did not cause any harm. However, whilst these are minor, they are still important to assess, report and provide corrective actions from the research office. Often these types of cases relate to system barriers or they can point to unforeseen issues within a department or even with a particular method or approach in a particular setting or cohort. Keeping record of these in a research office means that we can identify trends and larger problems at play, which can trigger a need for a deeper dive to address the root cause. Any complaint or report of research, um, poor research conduct or incidents um, relating to a research project must always be handled sensitively until the assessment or evidence is complete, avoiding blame and giving people the benefit of the doubt. Cases should always be managed in proportion to the severity and seriousness, including the corrective actions, the referrals to other departments, and any disciplinary action that results. People and researchers are no exception, inevitably feel nervous and apprehensive about reviews or assessments of their conduct. And as an integrity advisor, an assessment officer, or a delegate, we must be conscious of this and strive to promote fairness and transparency in our dealings, which helps to ensure truthfulness and honesty in the fact and information gathering phase of any case. So jumping in to talk about a specific case, I wanted to, something I've seen come up quite frequently is lost consent forms. Now, in identifying that a consent form is missing or multiple consent forms are missing from a particular study, it can result in a minor case review, which is managed in internally by the research office. But sometimes it can point to a larger problem at play um, relating to um, possibly failure to consent. And so I just want to talk through the differences of these two. The first example uh, was a clinical setting where the medical staff were responsible for the informed consent process and a number of consent forms uh, during an audit were identified as not being kept on file um, and were missing completely. Luckily in this case, because the consent was being taken in a clinical setting, we were able to identify other records which indicated that the consent process did take place. Um, and so there was a record supporting that process, but we didn't have an official signed form from the participant indicating that they agreed. 
in the assessment process, what it revealed was actually um, what caused this to happen was a process issue. So it was the environment and the responsibilities um, of the people who were taking consent. So first of all, the environment was very busy. It was a clinical space with lots of uh, different types of paperwork going in different uh, locations. And the people who were responsible for taking consent didn't fully understand where the research documents needed to be kept or who they needed to be sent to for record keeping. Then in addition to that, it was a department that had a very high turnover of staff, which meant that due process wasn't, there was limited opportunities for people to be educated about the correct process around the research. And when we looked at that as a whole, like as we said, we could see that the consent was being done correctly, but it was the record process that wasn't being managed correctly. And when we uh, went through the corrective actions and completed the process, it came out that the, the potential, uh, the, the case uh, was considered to be minor. There was no serious misconduct identified and the corrective actions that followed as a result was for the research team to review and modify their consent process and also who was responsible in the study for taking consent and keeping track of those records. So it ended up being a really positive experience from something that could have turned into a serious matter. Now, in another example where it did become serious, the missing consent forms actually identified that consent wasn't being taken for a research intervention. So this obviously has different set of implications and requires a different level of review. And once the initial information and fact gathering was completed by the research office, it was then referred up through our delegate to other delegates for consideration and resulted in um, the patient safety team undertaking a clinical incident review. And so what you end up having are these multiple uh, parties and, and departments with their expertise contributing into the investigation and fact gathering phase. And then the, initially the delegates were both the clinical governance um, executive and the human resource um, executive looking at it together and then once all the evidence was collected, it was determined that the human resource delegate was the appropriate person to lead the investigation, um, complete the review and carry out any um, corrective actions and disciplinary actions that were required as a result of this case. And I think <coughs> something that I want to point out here is that when when poor research conduct indicates acts of negligence or a clear disregard for the principles of good research practice, it's likely that that individual behaviour is also relating to professional conduct and a lack of respect for the organisational values and potentially the code of conduct, as well as potentially even clinical practice rules. Um, and that has been my experience in any serious cases that I've been a part of collecting evidence from the research office um, component is that there's often other professional matters at play with that particular individual team or even entire departments. And it is important that those matters are referred up to an appropriate delegate and that it's managed within the organisational framework that I talked about a bit earlier. Now, a common question that comes up is in these cases, how do you know that it's serious? How do you know the level of severity? How do you determine that it is minor? And there's a range of tools that you can use uh, to help during that fact gathering and information phase. And these can help to direct your questions or uh, the places that you seek information from, who you might need to engage in to gather additional information, and also can help point in terms of your referral pathways as to which departments need to be involved. And that's usually 
done with your designated officer um, or your re the, the delegate for the research office. So I wanted to, this particular tool is something that we've used at the Townsville Hospital and Health Service, and it is based on a, a publication that some of you might have seen in 2021. But what I wanted to point out here is around intent and motive. Uh, so the difference between accidental and carelessness or negligence and someone having no motive or um, they are trying to genuinely do the right thing in their project um, compared to someone who might be, their motives might be a little bit more self-interested, um, which can lead to those behaviours of disregarding principles and policies within not just their research conduct, but their professional conduct as well. Um, and then I've always found that the direct and indirect consequences of the incident or the event are really important to consider. And then those consequences can usually help pinpoint uh, which other departments need to be involved. So if there's a legal breach, um, if there's, as I said, an impact on a patient where there's been an intervention or a clinical matter, then the patient safety team need to be involved as well. Uh, so I think within an organisation, you need to come up with your own approach to uh, how research integrity uh, is embedded into your existing frameworks um, in terms of your workplace policies, your code of conduct, and, and the way that we handle complaints. So I've included some links here for you to uh, that might be helpful if you're looking at developing this or if you're wanting to understand more about it. Uh, I've included the Queensland Health Privacy Breach Management website just because I think a common one that comes up often for assessors is looking at data breaches or um, use of data outside of the original research protocol. So I hope this is helpful and I look forward to questions at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Um, it is absolutely vital to understand that and appreciate that research isn't something that's done on the side, which unfortunately still seems to um, transcend a lot of the organisations in which we work in, particularly in the health sector where clinical service delivery is considered the top priority. But really understanding that research isn't something that's you know, it sits outside. It is very much integrated and very much part of our everyday practice. And I think the more that, particularly as research integrity advisors and mentors and managers, the more that we can influence these conversations and have, um, you know, these conversations as part of our everyday research speak, if you like, the more possibility we have of um, preventing significant um, investigations and you know misconduct and all the rest of it so it was really fabulous to see how you've taken that case study and um, applied the intersection of policy so moving on to our next um, speaker Gordon McGurk so Gordon is currently the General Manager of Research Governance and Funding at QIMR Berghofer here in Brisbane. He's also the Chairperson of the University of Queensland, HREC A, and formerly of the RBW, um, Royal Brisbane Women's Hospital here in Brisbane, HREC as well. So while he was previously at the NHMRC, he wrote and rewrote parts of the code for the responsible conduct of research ran projects related to improving clinical trial governance in Australia, and also was the contact for research integrity and human and animal ethics. He has been admitted as a lawyer in Queensland, is a fellow of the Governance Institute of Australia and graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. And Gordon's really going to take us on a journey of how do we take the rules and regs that apply and enliven them in our um, everyday uh, practice in our organisations. So over to you, Gordon. Um, thank you, Sonny. Ah, just hopefully, let me just see if my PowerPoint will respond. There we go. Okay. Um, oh, God. Uh, right. Can you, uh, it's just trying to kick me out of Zoom at the moment. Can you, Sonia? Uh, it's just popped up. 
Okay, I uh, didn't say right. Uh, it's probably in um, a normal PowerPoint mode as, a, as opposed to presentation mode. Let's kick you back out again, I think. It's technical difficulties, our apologies. I think he must be coming back in by the looks of things. Right, I should be back in by now. Ah, you're on mute, Gordon. I shouldn't be on mute. There we go, perfect. Can hear you, off, over okay, to you. No. Uh, just share the screen again. It's amazing that uh, one can be in the middle of Brisbane and still have internet issues. Okay, right. Um, I think that's us now. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks, uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah, for uh, um, that last preso. So this is really, um, I, I guess, as uh, Sonia's pointed out, sort of trying to enliven, I guess, what research integrity or when it happens. How you know, how do you know when you're prepared and what do you do about it? How do you try and deal with cultural issues in an institution? And if, uh, you know, I think there's several caveats here. One that uh, um, you know, we, we deal with universities and medical research institutes and health services. And those in universities will be well aware of the scope of research integrity issues that arise and are probably largely well prepared for them. Of course, it's no um it's no secret that QIMR has had a major integrity issue with fabrication of data. And I will say that you only know how prepared you are when these things happen. And um, until such times, you can only do your best. But because we have developed these tools, and Sarah mentioned the uh, 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 seriousness uh, matrix, but the Health Translation Queensland, we have developed the um, maturity model for research integrity, which I've actually used in this preso, it's a really useful tool because you can see whether or not you are, what, what level you're at, how prepared you, you might be. So what I want to do is just go through a bit of the complexity and the process and then tell you how we've sort of approached it to try and overcome some cultural issues. Uh, and I've just thrown in one scenario there just because it, the, the detail required in dealing with integrity issues is significant. So um, is this going to move for me? There we go. Right. So the question about research integrity in an institution is, uh, is it utilitarianism? So the greatest good for the greatest number? Or do we make a bespoke approach so we uh, deal with people individually? Now, I'll leave, I'll leave that hanging for, for you to uh, to think about as we, as we move along. But clearly, um, as a medical research institute, we have a sort of captive audience. We only do medical research. We don't have to do arts and humanities as universities do. So uh, we don't necessarily have to deal with that same level of complexity. Um, I, I would say that hospitals are probably more similar to medical research institutes than, than universities, but you have a different issue insofar as the levels of, of people you have to deal with. Um, in talking about culture, I think we do face cultural barriers and historically when you haven't had any issues or when those issues have been shall I say uh I don't know not taken as seriously as they should otherwise have been one can develop a bit of uh, resistance to change within the, in the belief that if it ain't broke don't fix it nothing to see here so there can be entrenched views the size of your institution is, is, is definitely a factor because if you're doing online courses and you or you're giving individual presentations and you have to continually do them, you know, that's a significant impost on resources. Um, from our perspective, of course, we have different audiences. We have uh, obviously senior researchers down to um, PhD students, and then we have non-research staff. And one of the questions you should be asking yourself is to what extent do non-research staff have to understand some of these integrity concepts? Uh, my personal view is only, you know, there's a subset that they need to understand, not, not everything. So um, I wouldn't want to be gilding the lily too much because otherwise, you know, people will feel like it's a futile exercise. Um, and when I say it's complex, it really is, and you don't find this out until such times as you're in the middle of an event and you're criticized for not providing procedural fairness. Um, you might be criticized for, or, or 
you know, potential conflict of interest, perceived conflict of interest, as opposed to real or apparent. And you have to deal with these things. Sometimes they can be straw men or red herrings. Other times they may be real. You have to be prepared to deal with them through your own processes and potentially take external advice on whether or not there is anything to see. So, as I say, you do not really know how prepared you are until these things happen. Now, Sarah mentioned um, some of the rules and regulations, but we still have to understand that if you want to get grants from funding bodies such as the NHMRC, uh, who developed the code along with the ARC, you have to play by their rules. And that means there's a significant amount of toing and froing and communication with them uh, over what might be considered sort of banal issues so that you are informing them as much as, as they wish to. And don't forget then, as well as them, there's an oversight body called ARIC, Australian Research Integrity Committee. And I'll just get to a little scenario in a second. And then as uh, Sarah mentioned in, in Queensland, we have the Crime and Corruption Commission. So there are regulatory considerations as well. So notwithstanding the fact that you think you're on a research integrity journey, only when you're in the middle of it, do you realize where you really are. And I think this is where the maturity model uh, matrix can actually be useful. And I just wanted to mention ARIC because um, uh, it's it, you know, no secret here, and it, as a scenario, we had an authorship dispute, the individual wasn't satisfied with the outcome, despite the fact there was a preliminary assessment, it had been uh, assessed by the designated officer, provided the CEO, still not satisfied, went to the Australian Research Integrity Committee because they weren't satisfied, and the toing and froing and backwards and forwards, an amount of evidence we had to produce was really, really significant. It just protracts the issue. Whatever happens, you will realize that these things do not, are not resolved quickly. They can last quite a long time. Um, Eric finally agreed that the Institute had done everything it could, made a few suggestions for improvement. But as I say there, it was a very long drawn out process for little gain. And, um, you know, that, that's what we have to go through. So there is some oversight. I'm not saying that Eric is a perfect body in Australia. And many of you will know there is a push for uh, an external integrity body. Whether or not that occurs is, is, is one of these things. However, right now we have ARIC and we have to play by those rules. So I, I guess the question I wanted to ask was, what does research culture mean? And I, th I think I highlighted the fact we have entrenched views. So currently, you know, it, it, attitude is partly it. How do you bring people along on a journey when they believe there's nothing wrong or it's just another bit of administrivia or bureaucracy? And I put in there ethnicity because uh, it, and it's in a cultural sense, ethnicity is important. In a medical research institute, we have um, you know, uh, people from a wide range of ethnic backgrounds. So if you're going to design a process, how do you deal with a process that meets everyone's needs? Uh, even to the extent of having research integrity advisors with um, ethnic backgrounds in a non-tokenistic manner. So it gets a bit complex, even though you might feel you've done a great job by having research integrity advisors, you really have to consider your audience who you're trying to provide guidance to. Now, that last dot point there, I think is really important because are we as a research integrity entity, a sword or a shield? If people feel that we are there to um, slap them on the wrist when they do something wrong, then I don't think we really get anywhere. We have to be seen as part of a solution as opposed to just the, um, you know, the, the, the oversight body that only steps in when things are going wrong. Someone in this institute said to me, they said, do you know you're one of the most powerful people at this institute? And I've gone, well, that's a bit scary to start with. But ultimately, I would not want to be seen that way. I think our processes must represent uh, the way in which we act, which is with impartiality, with fairness. and uh, in a way that gets it right as opposed to our being right. And to that end, of course, here at QIMR, we have appointed integrity advisors so they can largely do the job of the integrity office. And so, uh, at least personally, I don't have to get involved until I really have to. So Daisy, put me one out there. Um, so are we a sword or a shield? And if we are a sword, people sometimes use us as that, as, as a threat. Um, by referring referring incidents to the integrity office, when in actual fact, there could have been a better process for something to be resolved at a local level. 
So as an integrity, integrity body, you can be used in a manner that, that probably does not represent the way it should be used. Okay, now what do we do here? Okay, my PowerPoint's not moving, which is really awkward. Okay, there we go. So what um, we did, what we have done at the Health Translation Queensland, or at least I think largely it came from uh, something that developed at QIMR, is developed a matrix model for determining how, as an entity, how prepared you are to deal in research integrity. And we had levels one to four, uh, kind of basic to fully integrated. And we have a level five, which uh, is, you know, in, in Maslow's hierarchy, it's a sort of self-actualization, uh, which means you have a really holistic approach. But what I wanted to do was use that matrix just as a means to say, okay, if I take it that we at QIMR are level four, we're fully integrated, how have we dealt with these institutional cultural issues? So if you look at those dot points there, it says we have a robust integrity framework, we're committed to following the code, and we ensure that barriers that may prevent researchers from raising concerns are removed. Now, I don't for a second think everyone on this call is in the same boat, but nevertheless, um, and I'm not saying that we, we are perfect either, because in some of the things I think we can definitely do better, but I just wanted to take you through uh, how we have uh, approach the cultural issue amongst other things and then how we've done the training. So as you see there, robust research integrity framework, blah, blah, blah. And what we have, of course, is our own QIMR Berkhofer research integrity framework, which at a high level basically says we will do the following, we'll, we'll follow the code, we'll support researchers, we'll review, etc. And under this, we had a research integrity plan. What's noticeable there is we're now in version six. And that's because this is a living document, which essentially says, here are all the activities we will do. And um, sometimes there are new ones. And that links closely with the plan. Uh, if I was to show you that, it, it is 90% complete. Uh, interestingly, it's probably the data management that we really have to work on a bit more. In a traffic light sense, 90% are in green, 8% uh, are in, in orange, and 2% uh, are in red. And I uh, can't actually remember what the, the red one is. Nevertheless, so we have a framework as a high level document. We have a plan, which are the activities we've carried out, and we know what we still have to do. So that's really useful because then that says we do have a robust framework. We're meeting that level four fully integrated. Does it take into account everyone's needs? Uh, not on its own. So in a holistic sense, a framework or a plan will not take into account everyone's needs. You have to then enliven it by saying, okay, do we do the 80-20 rule? Do we just go with uh, the greatest good for the greatest number? Or do we try and capture everyone in our approach? Now, in, 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 uh, in light of this, of course, and because uh, I'm just about to talk about how we've approached this, our level four uh, on the matrix for, for being fully integrated in, in, in terms of education and training, is having a de dedicated training officer, which we do. We have Marjorie as our dedicated training officer. Uh, structured training available for a designated officer. I don't actually think we have that. So, you know, we clearly have to lift our game there. But we are developing and have developed training through evidence-based and co-design approaches, which is really what I want to take you to now. So how do we as an institute increase the awareness of research integrity um, how do we integrate it into our day-to-day -day activities? And we took the view that rather than having just online courses, we had to approach this uh, as a, um, um, not just a top-down, but as a co-design approach, uh, meeting the needs of, of those different levels of uh, uh, researchers, as I pointed out. So we decided we would actually start with students and work our way upwards rather than working our way downwards. And the paper you see quoted there, the Melgar et al. in Nature, um, quoted uh, that the hierarchical implementation is doomed to fail. And we know there are reasons for this. One, because um, the agents of change are more likely to be those coming into research rather than those that have been there for a while. Not 100%, by the way, but I think we would all agree that, that those coming in are more responsive to change want to do things properly, can also upwardly manage and be the agents of change. 
So we took that approach with uh, the PhD students. But what we've also done is because of our, our approach to um, appoint 15 research integrity advisors is in large part get them to be doing the training. So myself and Marjorie and Cheryl were there, but largely, and, and I, I do some presenting, but uh, the research integrity advisors were there to answer questions, give their own views of the world and their own, their own um, experience. And that works well because then you, you develop those uh, relationships and rather than the office being seen as the single point of contact, we're only there if required. The other thing we did was we emphasized that this is not just about responsibilities. So Sarah mentioned, if you look at the code, there's lots of responsibilities in there. There's about 19 of them. But we sort of focus on the fact that in actual fact, you have rights as well, at least in relation to, for example, authorship. You have a right as an author to expect that if you meet the criteria for inclusion, you end up in a paper. You have the right to be able to say, I should be somewhere else on this authorship list based on what I've done. It's not just about responsibilities. Now, granted, when we talk about data management, you don't have many rights there. It's all about your responsibility to protect data. But in terms of rights, a lot of research integrity, you do have rights. And it's so important that people feel empowered to be able to stand up for their own rights. Because if you just make it responsibilities, I don't think that really um, either enlivens anything, engages, or empowers. Um, now, this is just another uh, slide from that Melgard paper, and all of, uh, which is called Nine Ways to Move from Talk to Walk. Uh, and one of those, of course, is integrity training. That's the fourth line down, I think, or third line down. Established training and confidential counselling for all researchers. And that's clearly what we're trying to do, starting at the bottom. So what we decided to do was develop these interactive student workshops using the re-aim approach. We wanted to determine whether the reach was good, effectiveness, adoption, um, and in the future, of course, determine whether or not it is implemented and whether it has been maintained. So here we have 125 PhD students, or did at the time, we got 66 responses about what they wanted. We asked them what they wanted in the following, oops, it is in the following areas. Uh, did you want online training? Do you want workshops? Do you want reading materials? How did town halls work for you, et cetera, et cetera? And you can see there that while they, you know, they had they like their online training, they also felt that short videos and workshops were very beneficial. So we went down this road of saying, okay, we will develop these videos. So we got our research integrity advisors to develop two each, uh, two in each subject, develop videos on conflict of interest, data management, authorship, and research integrity itself. And even though these videos are probably no more than five minutes long, by the way, I think some people said they wanted them even shorter. Um, and that's, you know, you got to deal with that. But I think five minutes max is, is actually really good. We have an area within QIMR that produces these things and they did a great job. I, I won't show any here, but they're available if you want to see them. Um, uh, so we went down the short of developing the workshops and we developed, uh, tailored it for, for the PhD students, as I said, rights and responsibilities. So these are the topics they wanted for training, how to avoid questionable research practices, manage data samples, report to manage conflicts of interest, and how to apply for ethics approvals. Um, the step two was develop the workshops and Marjorie uh, D'Souza in, in, the, in the office uh, was largely responsible for this. So we actually had four one hour sessions and we did this over two periods. So uh, had pizza in the middle. So like on a Monday, it would be 10 o'clock in the morning and two o'clock in the afternoon with pizza in the middle. And then they, four weeks after that, we did the other two. Um, had the short videos, got the research integrity advisors to do the case studies and the scenarios. And we used Mentimeter. Thanks, uh, thanks Mark, uh, for, for that, that suggestion. That worked really well. They were engaged. Obviously, everyone has a mobile phone on them. Some people never stop using them during the, during the session, but that's one of these things. And um, it, it seemed to, it did seem to engage them. And of course, the only way we can tell that is by uh, uh, um, evaluating the session. So clearly the evaluation wasn't brilliant. We didn't get too many responses for authorship. We did get some for conflict of interest and research integrity. But I think in summary, what you'll see is, uh, and those that are circled, you will see that the, 
largely they felt that in terms of conflict of interest, the knowledge was poor to average largely, and it moved to uh, very good to excellent, and similarly in research integrity. So I think by, even though we didn't have so many responses for evaluation, it was clear that those that responded were probably the, the engaged ones and uh, felt that their, their uh, knowledge had increased as a result. And I think it's just quite a good example of a co-design process where you're giving them what they think they need and then you're evaluating the process. Clearly, we have to determine whether it will be maintained uh, over, over a couple of years. But I think what we're going to do is we're going to use this principle as we move up the, the, la the level. Now, we've already met with the, 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 the postdoc association, and they've told us that they, they want something similar, but we'll abbreviate it because perhaps their knowledge is actually better. Clearly, for the conflict of interest, it will come as no surprise that even senior people, senior researchers within this institution have very little idea of what constitutes a conflict of interest. So I wouldn't really want to skimp there. I do think though we can actually crystallize it into a more concise uh, delivery rather than, than spending an hour doing it. Nevertheless, the key principles are essential. And if senior researchers within any institution are not aware of their conflicts of interest, and by the way, sometimes it's not easy to tell so that's why you have to get someone else to do it, then it's something we really have to work on. Data management, I guess we feel, is another uh, serious concern here and it probably represents one of our biggest risks. So I wouldn't want to skimp on that, especially because people collect personal information and, and uh, biospecimens. So we will work our way up the, the research chain with the postdocs. Instead of having four one-hour sessions, it'll probably be four half-hour sessions. Um, and then I think we'll do the same with the senior researchers after that. But we've just had a review of our culture and called the Lander Review. It went to about 800 pages. And clearly, we, you know, we have to try and improve our culture. But what it says is that even those at the top need to understand their responsibilities in relation to research, use of animals, et cetera, et cetera. So no one should be exempt from this. The question is, how do you deliver what you propose to give them? And I think using this approach and tailoring it for uh, the audience is really important. Now, going back then to that initial slide about whether we actually be, have bespoke approach or whether we just aim for the 80-20 rule, I think this would be the approach where we actually capture everyone. Um, and uh, I think um, if we do, do it that way, that, then no one will be exempt and we can actually uh, uh, probably live the values that Sarah was mentioning. So one final slide, clearly integrity is the choice between what's convenient and what's right. And uh, philosophically, I think this is about getting it right, not just being right. And we really have to work to, to get it right. Using that matrix is a really useful tool. So there will be a link to that provided if you have a look at it. And, and I guess just determine where you are on the scale, see if you can assess yourself by that standard and even use it as an aid memoir for putting things in place. So I'm just going to stop there and say a quick thank you to uh, Cheryl Lin Ong for providing some of the slides and also to Marjorie for doing the training for research integrity. And I will, of course, take any questions as they arise. Thank you for that. Thank you, Gordon. Um, it's blown me away in terms of both your presentation and Sarah's presentation. It really does speak to that research integrity is absolutely about doing what's right, but yet is seemingly um, overcomplicated when fundamentally it speaks to our core values as professionals, whether that be in the academic sector, in the non-government sector or in the government sector um, so really it is about that fundamental or doing what's right 
what's important to note as the questions sort of start to come through through the chat function is that this presentation and recording will be available. So I certainly do encourage every one of you to share the link when it becomes available through to your networks because standing on the shoulders of giants and those that have gone before us is ab absolutely crucial as we mature research integrity into everyday thinking and practice. Okay, so I'm just going to have a quick look at the chat function. First question from um, Olamide has actually been answered by Sarah. Thank you so much for doing that behind the scenes. Um, okay, first question from Lynn is, while you can work to change the culture of the Institute, the problem seems to be the culture and research and the pressures, the old publish or perish and drive funding. It's the pressure that can lead to integrity breaches. How can that be dealt with? Uh, hey, Lynn, thank you for that. Um, yeah, look, no doubt. Uh, and I think if you read uh, any of these integrity papers, and I can't remember which one it was, it might be in the Melgard one, but you know, three of the factors that are, are clearly represented in uh, research integrity issues, at least serious ones, are um, the need to the, the need for it or whether that's a need to stay at the top of your game or the need to get funding um the opportunity to do so and then the ability to rationalize and i think that last one's really important because what it kind of means is for the most part uh, it's a philosophical kind of approach and i don't necessarily think that everyone falls into that same boat and while you may have some extreme examples, as, as we certainly have, I do believe that for the most part, bringing people along the journey is, 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 is the way to do it. For the reason that I don't think most people are, even though there is pressure to publish, I don't think most people are really um, you know, drawn to that mode of operation. That said, there was a, a Dutch paper uh, that looked at the questionable research practices by researchers in, in, in Holland, um, and they had a significant number of responses. And I can't remember what the, 11%, I think, uh, had engaged in research misconduct. I don't know what level that is, but I do think that only by having to deal with serious things, you know, and, and then you'll be able to differentiate between, you know, the cultural aspects, that is to say who, you know, um, where you think, the culture of the institute lies, then can you actually approach it? So I think using this approach is useful. I'm not saying it's perfect. It's useful for us. Again, we'd have to evaluate it just to see exactly how useful it has been. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions for you, Gordon. Great presentation. Absolutely. What was the time frame for the shift at QIMR with respect to research integrity? Uh, well, you know, you, you, those at universities can answer this as well as I. Um, it, it depends on the leadership and the leadership's commitment to wanting to change. And when you have something that that has been such a you know flagrant, egregious, you know, breach of trust as well as um, of, of research conduct, there really has to be be a shift. Now. Um, I'm not saying for a second that everyone is, you know, is is along for the same journey. I think we have to bring the most people along, which probably gets that next question, what the 80-20 rule is. And I think if you can bring 80% of people along, that's a great start. I'd rather bring 100% along. But uh, the shift itself will start with the 80%. And by that approach of co-design, etc., I think you can really get that 80% on board Getting the other twenty percent may be a challenge for those cultural reasons that it has become entrenched and you know nothing to see here, etc. So, just uh, you know, it, it it's institution specific, but it will not surprise me if most institutions are similar. So, Gordon, and then in terms of you know how to engage these people, the a question on the chat line is about at what stage of candidature were students encouraged to take the workshop that you described. Oh, um, look, any, any any PhD students, and it, it turns out, you know, since we did them, there's probably been another 25 PhD students, so clearly we're going to have to do it again, but we'll probably uh, um, probably join, join them in with, with the postdocs. So I think the thing is that 
the, the PhD students, of course, this is a medical research institute and not a university, and then they have to go through their own university online research integrity stuff. But this is just another way of thinking about it. This is more resources and a different way of engaging them in the process. So I think if we say that all PhD students roughly have to know all of this stuff, but by empowering them with their rights as well as their responsibilities, you actually really help them on the research journey. And um, those who have done any training, I'm sure would agree that uh, trying to teach an old dog new tricks is a lot more difficult than teaching you know, a puppy new tricks. So I think, um, and with, uh, I'm not trying to be demeaning to any PhD students there, by the way, but I, just saying that I think their minds are a lot more open to change and to doing the right thing and finding ways to do it. And by the way, this is only one approach. That's not to say there cannot be other approaches. There, I'm sure there are other approaches to, uh, to doing training that, that will work. And I'm sure we'll hear some other examples on this forum in, in coming uh, months. Absolutely. Another question for you is in terms of educating researchers on how they will how they will be protected if they bring up an issue. You know, one of the key considerations is that you know people can be made to be afraid or feel afraid to speak up. So, is there a change in the culture around how this is managed? Um, you know, that's a really tricky one. Uh, and so we have. Um, we now have an um, anonymous complaints handling system called Your Call. I don't believe it's actually had any business yet. And, and honestly, I think people like face to face. Um, but um, you know, you, you you have to a have the resource. You have to b promote the resource. And I do like the idea of of having these integrity advisors at different levels because I don't really want to get involved if I don't have to. So many things can be resolved at a local level. But if you have peers who can actually provide advice before they even come to uh, before they even come to the research integrity office, then, then I think that works really well. Clearly we have to, as I said about being a sword or a shield, if we're just a sword, then you know no one's gonna no one's gonna want to come to us. No one wants to raise their voice if they think they're going to be um castigated uh, as as a result. And we did have an incident here very recently where, you know, one of our ethics committees wanted to refer something to, to the integrity office. And that's, you know, that's quite a significant uh, thing to do uh, before you've actually established the facts. So being clear about when things get um, referred is important because if you don't get that right, then you're less likely for people to actually want to raise their voice. But we do have an anonymous complaints handling system. They are protected. It's handled externally. It can be done. We just have to keep promoting that um, uh, resource. Fantastic. And given the um, the time, I've probably got room for one more. Um, again, thank you for a very useful presentation. Is there a message about how applying research integrity actually improves research rigour and quality? Oh, hi, Susan. Uh, yeah, thanks for being online. So, look, um, philosophically, and uh, I think this is something we would want to move towards. I think research integrity per se is is just one arm of a very broad, you know, a, a broad brush. And when I look at a medical research institute like here, when we, you know, we 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 have a an endowment and we get money from donors, I don't think just by having research integrity, good research integrity, is really a holistic message. I think our message has to be one of research quality. How do we demonstrate research quality? We demonstrate um, how we manage manage the money that comes in, how we manage people's data, how we we manage research. And and Susan, I think also I'm, I'm struggling really with how we how we get the research impact in there. But you know a lot of people think research quality is research impact, but I don't think so. I think that's just part of the whole the whole brush. So I think really we have to think of it and uh, not just as research integrity, but research integrity is part of, you know, our, our research quality spectrum. And only by promoting research quality and showing people all of the stuff we do to, to do good research, to show that research is, is robust and the data is robust and we manage data, I think that's the only way forward. So clearly we have to get integrity right, but it's a lot broader than that. Yeah. 
Um, so thank you again to, to both you, Gordon and Sarah, for um, making yourselves available and presenting on a really, really important uh, view of research integrity in the real world. I'd like to thank Health Translation Queensland for hosting and certainly welcome the floor to engage with Health Translation Queensland and you know send uh, contact details if you'd like to speak to any of the speakers in person and certainly uh, continue conversations and broaden the research integrity network across Queensland, but more broadly across Australia. Thank you everyone for your time. Um, and I'm sure that this will only start conversations as opposed to be the, the panacea for all. Thank you.